Seule entente au pays qui contient une formule de reconnaissance des droits ancestraux, y compris le petit aborigène, sur l'ensemble du territoire. Tonight, three Innu communities move towards a modern-day treaty. Status cards in many ways are a curse and a blessing. Plus, a new BC report finds those who use status cards experience discrimination. She, um, she talks about having a great-great-grandmother who was Cherokee, so uh, from there I just started digging. And questions come up about Premier Danielle Smith's Cherokee claims. Hello, good evening, Tonse, and welcome to APTN National News. I'm Daryl Stranger. Today is the day North Baffin Island residents have been waiting for, a final decision on the proposed expansion of the Mary River Iron Ore Mine. Northern Affairs Minister Dan Vandal just made the announcement, and our Kent Driscoll joins us from Iqaluit. Kent, is the mine growing, or are they sticking with the status quo? Yes, yes we do. The Department of Northern Affairs has sided with the Nunavut Impact Review Board and decided to not allow Phase 2 expansion of the Mary River Iron Ore Mine. Now, here's part of what Northern Affairs Minister Dan Vandell wrote to the Nunavut Impact Review Board. Quote, The other responsible ministers and I are sensitive to the economic significance of both the ongoing Mary River Mine operations and the Phase 2 proposal to the North Baffin region, and Nunavut more generally. However, we have taken particular note of the conclusions of the board, the designated Inuit organizations, and the hunters and trappers organizations, given their specific roles outlined in the Nunavut Agreement, who have expressed a lack of confidence that Phase 2, as currently conceived, can proceed without unacceptable impacts. Now, the decision was published late this afternoon. Vandell's office had already received a 90-day extension to review the over 400-page decision. And this process, it's been underway since 2014. Now, earlier, the Nunavut Impact Review Board denied the mine permission to double production, including turning down a proposal that would have seen a railway installed to make the ore easier to get to ships. Our reaction has been mixed in the communities most affected, Pond Inlet and Arctic Bay. And many of the residents see the benefit of having jobs in their communities, while others worry that the mine is hurting the wildlife. Now, the Mary River Iron Ore Mine, it's located in between Pond Inlet and Arctic Bay, Nunavut. Uh, they were seeking to double their production, and there are currently 1,100 jobs at that site. Around 300 of them are held by Inuit. Uh, we'll be following the reaction as it rolls out. Back to you in Winnipeg. Today, APTN News reported Alberta's new Premier, Danielle Smith, has made several claims over the years that she has Cherokee ancestry. Our reporter, Danielle Parody, dug into those claims and enlisted the help of a few genealogists. We have Danielle here to talk about her story today. Danielle, thanks for joining us here. Uh, Smith's statements about her ancestry have been around for years. Uh, what was it that made you interested in looking into these claims now? Yeah, most recently um, there was a, a tweet that uh, Danielle Smith sent out about uh, firing a phone bank contractor. And there she talks about how she's somebody with Indigenous ancestry. And I actually hadn't heard that before. So um, I, I started looking around at thinking, had she claimed that before? Uh, and I found out a whole like a, a few other instances on her radio show um, as well as uh, in the Alberta legislature where she um, she talks about having a great great grandmother who was Cherokee so uh, from there I just started digging and, and worked with some genealogists to put together the story. So in the story you talk about the uh, Cherokee Nation being very well documented what can you tell us about that? Uh, yeah, I mean, due to the Trail of Tears and the um, and the Dawes Rolls, which is the rolls of the so-called so five civilized tribes in the U.S., uh, they were really they, they documented similar to the Indian Act um, members who belong a to a part of one of the nations, and they, they would exist on these rolls known as the Dawes Rolls. So anybody claiming to be Cherokee uh, would need to point to an ancestor that is on these rolls. Okay, and when you were writing the story, what did the genealogist have to say about the fact that there are so many unsupported claims about Cherokee identity? 
Yeah, one of my first questions to her was not not just specific to Danielle Smith, but in general, it seems like we keep hearing these stories about people claiming Cherokee ancestry. Elizabeth Warren is another famous example, um, but there are others. And uh, I asked her, what, what is going on with that? Why are there so many claims? She said in the last US Census, there were more people claiming to be Cherokee than were actually in the Cherokee Nation itself. There's a lot of reasons for that. Some people associate it with um, so-called white guilt and the idea that we need that people are looking to distance themselves from these horrifying stories that they hear be it in Canada with residential schools or or in the US with the Trail of Tears or uh, or they also had industrial schools there too so it, it could be that uh, it could be um, you know just a family lore the sort of story people talk about and then never really look into uh, there's a few factors but whatever it is it's very common that's super interesting uh, what you just said there about some of those claims. Um, what has the response been so far to the story? Pretty big response so far, Daryl. Uh, lots of activity online. Um, I would say it's, it's very mixed whenever we're talking about stories. Uh, and I'm not saying that this is a pretendian story. This is somebody claiming that they had uh, Cherokee ancestry. And that's not quite the same thing as, say, taking a job at a university and claiming to have Indigenous ancestry. We're, we're dealing with something a little bit different, but she has used it in the past um, during the 2012 lake of fire incident where uh, her and her party came under scrutiny for some anti-LGBTQ remarks. Uh, she actually, that's when she started to talk about being Cherokee and, and having, you know, the, her family, her own family story of her great grandmother being, great great grandmother being moved on the, because of the Trail of Tears. So I, I think it's important to investigate these claims as they come up. Uh, and, and that's the general uh, feedback I'm getting right now. Well, we're going to have to leave it there, Danielle, but we certainly appreciate you coming on and updating us uh, on this important story. So thank you, Miigwech, for updating us. Thanks, Daryl. The Union of BC Indian Chiefs have commissioned a study across the province asking if Indigenous people have ever faced discrimination while using their status cards. APTN's Tina House has more. Initiated in 1876, the Indian Act was created by the federal government to define and administer Indian status to First Nations people in Canada. Section 6 of the Indian Act describes the criteria to be entitled to become a status Indian, which gives tax exemption, medical and dental coverage, and other benefits. Status cards are considered legal identification similar to a passport. However, according to the results of a new report commissioned by the Union of BC Indian Chiefs of 1,026 respondents, all except four reported experiencing discrimination along the spectrum of rarely to always at various type of retail and service businesses when presenting their status cards to non-Indigenous people. Status cards in many ways are a curse and a blessing. In 2019, Maxwell Johnson and his granddaughter Tori Ann went to this Bank of Montreal to open up a bank account for Tori Ann. They showed their status cards, and a bank employee confiscated the cards and called 911 because she suspected fraud. Vancouver police came into the bank and took Max and his 12 year old granddaughter outside, handcuffing them both and questioning them, later releasing them with no incident. However, that left them both with deep trauma. The report was commissioned by the Union of BC Indian Chiefs because of what happened to Max and Tori Ann. According to the report called, They Sigh or Give You the Look, Discrimination and Status Card Usage, 37% of Indigenous people say that clerks act as if status cards are not acceptable as ID. 33% claim clerks act as if processing status cards is a hassle. 30% claim clerks displayed microaggressions or other nonverbal communications. And 25% say clerks were rude verbally and nonverbally. From this report, there's a lot of people that don't use their status cards because they don't want to be, uh, have anything racist or any bad situations. You know, I just want to encourage everybody to use it. And uh, by using it, we're, we're just going to make them... Uh, more aware of our status cards, that it is a government issue uh, ID. Grand Chief Stuart Phillips says he himself has faced racism and most times doesn't use his status card to avoid comments from non-Indigenous people around him. 
it's a constitutional and legal right that was a consequence of long protracted legal battles and so on and so forth. Um, unfortunately, um, the background of this issue is the fact that we live in a very, very racist country. And historically, Indigenous peoples have suffered uh, racialized hate of the non Indigenous population in terms of their perceived notion that somehow Indigenous people enjoy certain benefits that aren't available to the general population. Tina House, APTN National News, Vancouver. All right, it's time for a short break, but still to come, today marks 137 years since Canada executed Louis Riel. We'll have that story next. Welcome back. Today marks 137 years since Canada executed Louis Riel. In Ottawa, a couple of Métis politicians took time to talk about his legacy and contributions to the Métis Nation and Canada. APTN's Fraser Needham has this story. Dan Vandel is the Minister of Northern Affairs. He says Riel's impact on Canadian history cannot be underestimated. But Vandel is also the Liberal Member of Parliament for a riding in Winnipeg with a strong connection to Riel. I consider him a father of Confederation, uh, Manitoba's first Premier. I'm honoured that Riel was born in the constituency 
the riding that I represent, St. Boniface, St. Vital, and I'm equally honored that he, uh, he rests there. His tomb is in uh, St. Boniface Cemetery and uh, was elected three times as a member of parliament, but was never allowed to take his seat in the House of Commons. Edmonton NDP MP Blake Desjardins says the accomplishments of Riel and Métis people as a whole have largely gone unrecognized in Canada. But things are changing. I really think there's been a significant change. Métis people in Canada have a really unique history, one that has been almost excluded from the history books for generations. A lot of folks wouldn't know, but Métis people have been here a very long time. We have one of the oldest patriotic flags in North America, and Métis people have contributed not just to the founding of Canada and the Prairie Provinces, but even before then. We were the folks who were ushering in a whole era of fur trade, of commerce. Unfortunately, Riel's grave marker in the St. Boniface Cathedral Cemetery was vandalized last month. And Vandell had this to say about the incident. No, that it was a horrible act, uh, unbelievably uh, uh, insensitive, uh, and I hope they find the person who did it and he receives his just punishment, he or she. Winnipeg police are investigating it as a hate crime and identified this male pictured here as a suspect. Anyone with information is asked to call Winnipeg's Major Crimes Unit at 204-986-6219. Fraser Needham, AP10 National News, Ottawa. Three Innu communities are negotiating a new treaty with Canada and Quebec, but the other five Innu communities in the province are not involved, and the Huron-Wendat nation says it encroaches on their ancestral land. A story by Chouchon Bacon, translated by Tom Finario, and read by Amelia Fournier. At this summit of elected officials of the Innu Nation in Lac Beauport, Quebec, a possible treaty of the Pedabin groups leaves nobody indifferent. Three of the eight Innu communities in Quebec are part of the Pedabin group, Esipit, Mashtoyash, and Nutashkuan. These communities are working on a draft of a future treaty to be presented to their members on March 31st. Il y a beaucoup de sphères, l'autonomie gouvernementale, tout l'aspect territorial, Inuitun, Inuimun. Il y a plusieurs, plusieurs aspects également là, qui vont en lien avec la déclaration des peuples autochtones sur la, avec l'ONU. Euh, C'est très élaboré, c'est euh, presque 400 pages là, de documentation. Details are embargoed at this time, but the Pedabin group are confident that the agreement will be influential to others. Je vous le dis, c'est la seule entente au pays qui contient une formule de reconnaissance des droits ancestraux, y compris le titre aborigène, sur l'ensemble du territoire. Si jamais, effectivement, là, on voit que les gouvernements euh, font fausse route, euh, honorent pas leur responsabilité ou leur engagement derrière le traité, ben on va avoir les outils pour livrer des bonnes batailles, effectivement. Là, puis, But another fait... First Nation openly objects to this draft treaty. Grand Chief Rémi Vincent of the Huron-Wendat Nation says that part of the Innu land claim falls on their ancestral territory. Vincent adds no treaty will be signed as long as the territorial issue with the Huron-Wendat is not settled. Je vais ré réitérer encore une fois qu'on a, on a offert, on est offert à s'asseoir avec les gens de Pédaban qui viennent nous voir ici chez nous puis qu'on discute des vraies choses. Earlier this year, relations between the Innu of Mashtoyash and Huron-Wendat reached an all-time low when two future sites for traditional Innu family camps were wrecked by heavy machinery because the Huron-Wendat said it was being built on their land. The dispute remains an obstacle to communication between Pedabin and the Huron-Wendat. Ils ont dépassé les bornes et là-dessus ce qu'on leur souhaite, ce qu'on propose, puis ça regardez, on, on a manifesté ces, tout ça par écrit, c'est que réparer après ça là, on va être en mesure de s'entendre, de discuter, puis je suis convaincu qu'on va s'entendre si effectivement il y a de la bonne foi de Parado. The negotiations for this future treaty date from the end of the 1970s, when 12 communities were gathered around a table that also included the Etsikamek. Now they are only three communities. The word pedabin in the Innu language means dawn. So is this agreement the dawn of modern self-governance for three Innu communities? 
Regardless, it appears there may be some troubled waters ahead before they can put pen to paper. A story by Shushan Bacon, APTN National News, Lac Beauport, Quebec. All right, it's time for one final break, but before that, this week on Sports with Stranger, I took things outside the studio for a body break. Here's a preview of what's to come. Hey guys, Daryl Stranger here, coming up soon on another segment of Sports with Stranger. As you can see, I just finished my workout. Uh, I worked out with a coach Evan, also known as Nish Coach. He's an indigenous fitness instructor who does online classes and workout classes for people who want to do that. So I worked out with him and that will be coming up soon on APKIN National News. Welcome back. It's time now for our photo of the day. Our viewer and regular contributor, Greg Scriber, sent in this amazing photo of the sunset over the Ottawa River near Orleans, Ontario. Greg described it as appearing as though the sky was on fire. And uh, I say we have to agree. Thanks for that, Greg. You can submit your photos by email to share at aptn.ca for the chance to be our next photo of the day. All right, now let's take a look at tomorrow's weather forecast. Starting on the East Coast, uh, 11 degrees in St. John's and 1 in Charlottetown. Minus 3 in Happy Valley Goose Bay and minus 1 in Cartwright. 0 degrees in Quebec City and minus 1 in Montreal. 0 degrees in Peterborough and minus 2 in Sault Ste. Marie. Some snow and minus 7 in Timmins, and snow and minus 8 in Big Trout Lake. Minus 13 in snow in Churchill, and minus 10 in Norway House. Minus 7 and snowing in Barron's River, and snow and minus 6 in Winnipeg. Minus 11 in Regina, and minus 13 in North Battleford. Minus 10 in La Ronge, and minus 8 in Stony Rapids. Heading west, clear in minus 9 in High Level, and minus 9 in clear in Peace River. Minus 6 in Edmonton and minus 8 in Calgary. 
plus 9 in Vancouver and plus 2 in Bella Coola. 8 degrees in Sands Pit and minus 9 in Fort Nelson. Minus 22 in Mayo and clear and minus 9 in Rock River. Minus 12 in clear Norman Wells and minus 11 in Yellowknife. Minus 5 in Anuvik and minus 15 in Colville Lake. Minus 27 in Snow in Cambridge Bay and minus 22 in Chesterfield. Minus 19 in Arctic Bay and minus 15 in Iqaluit. It could have been the first time the Canada Winter Games would have had Arctic and Dene sports. But now the Yukon is pulling out of its 2027 Games bid. Territorial officials say it can no longer proceed with its bid due to a lack of federal support. Canada is offering a maximum dollar amount of $16.7 million for the Games, including $3 million in capital. The Yukon government says that's the standard amount for small jurisdictions and less than 3% of what it asked for. They also say that money won't cover the cost of building necessary projects like infrastructure and from, from infrastructure to incorporate Arctic and any sports. To have yeah, our uh, Indigenous athletes be showcased on that kind of stage would have been great, but we can't really take the pessimistic view of it of all. I mean, we just got to really keep spirits high and just know that there's other competitions. This week on APTN In Focus, we brought the show out of the studio and onto the lands to talk about land-based education. We visited Camp Morningstar, an encampment in Hollowater First Nation in Manitoba, built to raise awareness of a proposed silica sand mine near the community. Here's a look at today's episode. Creating awareness or bringing attention to what was being proposed in our backyard. The uh, the mining of uh, silica sand. How important is a place like this, especially for the youth? I mean, there's a group of kids here from um, a school in Winnipeg. Some of them are from the area. Getting back to the earth, getting back to the land, getting back to the roots of who we really are. We carry something that is so old. I'm not here to introduce something new. This is how our ancestors lived. This is what our grandmothers and grandfathers, and this is how they thrived because they were happy. They weren't sick like the way we are today. Coming here and having this opportunity has really been uh, eye-opening, learning things that I've never really learned about from people that are way more experienced than any teachers I've had, been able to have at school talk about things. When I, when I learned about it in school, it's kind of just someone was reading out of a textbook. Uh, community means a lot here, for sure, and I learned just about being thankful and grateful for what you have and stuff. That was very important, and learning about the environment and how it has an impact on the Anishinaabe. Me and my family, we kind of like lost our culture, you know, like um, lost our land, and it was just like, I really wanted to experience something like this. It's like really sentimental to me. And it's like powerful that I get to do this and my mom couldn't, you know, so I'm doing this for her as well. And what have you learned in the short, short time that you've been here that uh, maybe you didn't think you would? Um, I kind of learned the backstory of this place and I really appreciated that and I didn't know much, you know, like I wanted to learn more. All right, that's all we have for you tonight on APTN National News. If you missed any of our stories and you want to catch up, you can do so online at aptnnews.ca. I'm Daryl Stranger. For all of us here, thank you for joining us, miigwech, and have a great night.